Welcome to the Syntax Supper Club. Today with us, we have Connor Rogers and Corey LaVisca from Font Awesome. Font Awesome changed the game for icons back in the day, taking a process that was tedious and simplified it into just installing a font. Not only that, but it was the most funded and, and still the most funded and backed software Kickstarter of all time. Uh, Font Awesome is back. And they're back with Web Awesome. It's an open source library of web components that will work with any framework because it's based on web standards. So we're here today to talk all things Web Awesome. Uh, welcome to the show, Corey and Connor. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Good, good to be here. Yeah. And real quick, before we get going, this show is brought to you by Sentry. It's the awesome place to find all of the bugs in your software. Head on over to sentry.io forward slash syntax. Sign up and get two months for free. Wes. Yeah. So l let me tell the, the story of, of how this episode came about because I think it's kind of interesting. So we just dropped our huge episode on UI components, UI frameworks, kind of like we talked about everything from headless to some styles to uh, you just drop them in, you can you can work with them. And uh, that show did really well. And there was lots of really good conversation around it. And like one thing I said during the episode, I was like, I mentioned probably a thousand different libraries, but I'm probably not hitting them all. Um, and I even told a bunch of people, like, please, like, pull request them to the show notes because it's it's interesting to see them all. Um, and one of the ones that we had talked about was was Shoelace. And Shoelace is a web component-based UI framework that gives you everything from alert, badge, breadcrumb, dialog box, details, date picker. And, and then, like, the next day, I was just talking about like the Sentry has this really cool date picker where you can, instead of having to select a range of dates, you can just say like five days. And and, and Connor was like, yeah, like that's a very hard thing to do well accessibly. And, uh, and we, we kind of talked back and forth about uh, the frustrations around it and whatnot. And then I realized that he was the one working on Shoelace. And I didn't even realize that Font Awesome has sort of taken, I guess we can get the story from these guys, but Font Awesome has taken Shoelace under its wing or, or joined, or I'm not sure what the, the whole story is. I, I kind of waited till the podcast to get it. And it was raised $600,000 Canadian, at least, for this new framework thing. So pretty, this is this is awesome. So I think there's, there's a lot to talk about here. So like, first of all, Connor, Corey, you want to introduce who you are and, and what you do? So yeah, uh, again, thanks for having us. Uh, my name is Corey LaVisca. I created Shoelace a number of years ago, and it's been a, quite a wild ride. And more recently, as you said, we've joined Fawn Awesome to build it out into a sustainable open source project with a uh, you know pro offer on top of that. And there's, there's a ton of awesome stuff that we're doing over here. I originally created Shoelace back in 2017, and it was sort of an alternative to Bootstrap. Shoelace is actually a play on the name Bootstrap, if that's oh. not too, super oh, wow. obvious. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> no, yeah. it's not. <laughs> uh, cool. So, um, yeah, and, and it was basically I didn't CSS. even know that, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> that's the so first I knew about that. <laughs> Is a CSS framework uh, where uh, this is back where we still had IE 11 to worry about and custom properties were they were a thing, but they weren't really widespread at the time. And what I noticed was everyone was using Bootstrap and Bootstrap was awesome because you could configure like one SAS variable and just everything would update. But nobody was doing that. Everyone was, was using it from the CDN. So all these websites had bootstrap.min.js you know, <laughs> and .css. But the problem was they were. They, they, there'd be like 400 line CSS files to customize all these things. And it's like, why, why are we doing this? We have CSS custom properties. Shoelace was a very bleeding edge thing at first where, you know, you could set one CSS custom property and all of a sudden your brand color was everywhere. And, and that was sort of how it kicked off. Um, and so it's always been a bit bleeding edge. Fast forward to about 2020, web components were a thing now and, and browsers were supporting them more widely. And I thought, you know, let's do 2.0. Let's just make it more than a CSS framework. Let's make it a web component framework because then, then it can just work everywhere. We'll take all this bleeding edge stuff that we, we can't really use in production yet, um, which we can nowadays, but we couldn't then. And we'll, we'll continue that bleeding edge thing. Let's just see what the browsers can do. And so it was reinvented as a web component library. And we're, we're now sort of transitioning it into a framework. But 
at the time it was like, can I build all these components? Can I let people just load them all on a CDN, set a couple custom properties, get all their colors and everything else, and then still style them if they want to do overrides with CSS, if they want to, you know, what can the browser do? That's really what it's always been about. And so that's where we kind of landed and it got kind of popular as browsers became more modern and evergreen. We, we just kind of started seeing more people use them and, and, and like the, the library. And yeah, that's sort of how it all kind of kicked off. Nice. And, and Corey, yeah, you, you, so you've been working on Shoelace for quite some time. Connor, how did you arrive at, at Shoelace? Yeah, so it's kind of an interesting story how I got here. I'll, I'll give a little background of like how I even got into web dev in the first place. So yeah. I'm fully self-taught. I don't have any degrees to my name. So I, you know, I, I worked as a paramedic for eight years. So like oh. I'd, I'd be like in firehouses or like, huh. you know, at, at base, I'd be coding away. And I still remember, I don't know exactly how I got started with Shoelace, but I remember everyone was mentioning it and I was like, wow, this looks really cool. This looks really nice. Everything is awesome. And this is probably around 2020, like probably around September, around that area. And um, I still remember I wrote the uh, the Rails docs for Shoelace and how to integrate it with Webpacker, which is like a special like wrapper on top of Webpack for Rails. I wrote it in the Brookline Fire Department firehouse on my birthday. I still remember <laughs> oh, it. I awesome. remember it clearly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's and then so like cool. a month later, I got hired for my first job and like I backed off a little bit using it, but I still really enjoyed it for like personal projects. So I made PRs. I I never really got into the whole React hype train. It just never like clicked with me. It really never was my thing, but I really enjoyed working with web components. And then, you know, I was making PRs, but like I was busy with my full time job in Rails at this point. And then after that, my the startup I was working for shut down about nine months later stars aligned long story short i ended up getting hired at microsoft working with Corey, and like that wow. really and we work on an internal design system using web components similar to shoelace so that's okay. how i got started in it was like i just got i just got pulled along with Corey, and i was like i'm i'm sticking to the to the uh bootstraps here and just <laughs> hanging along the coattails nice that's awesome and so where you are today is that Fawn Awesome, which is like, I think probably everybody unless you knows what it is, but they, Fawn Awesome absolutely changed the game for icons. I don't know, probably 10 years ago where you load the uh, script into your, or some CSS into your page, and then you just have an I tag with the class of FA and then FA dash whatever, and you get all these amazing icons and it was just so much faster than everything, and and quite honestly, I I would I tweeted the other day. I'm like like n nothing has come close to the ease of Fawn Awesome is today. And I know a lot of people aren't don't necessarily use that anymore, but Fawn Awesome, incredibly successful project. I think incredibly successful business. What's the story with them trying to now get into the web component and UI kit game? Yeah, that, that's an interesting story. Um, the, the thing I really love about being here is Fawn Awesome folks are very platform oriented, right? We see frameworks come and go. We see things come and go, trends yeah. come and go. Uh, and, and there's just a fundamental need for stability out there that we just haven't had on the front end. Everyone's fatigued. And and when you look at, you know, I mean, I mean React is a little sticky. I'll give it that. It's it's a It does a lot of awesome things. It's very sticky. But even React sort of has its its issues with like, well, you know, we started with class-based components. Now we moved to hooks. Now we have this React server components. What are all these things? So there's mm -hmm. even a little bit of instability there. And I think what people want is to be able to just use something that works and that continues to work for an indefinite amount of time. And the one thing that we can say with, with certainty is that the platform does that, right? I mean, Blink Tags, they're deprecated. I think uh, they still work in certain browsers. Marquee actually still works, even though that's been deprecated. But yeah. my point is, you know, 20, 30 years ago, your HTML still will render in a browser today. And so the platform to me was something that uh, it just made a lot of sense, right? And that's where Web Components came in, because uh, I'll, I'll be honest, I, I created an app, I created a SaaS, um, in, and I wrote it in Vue 2. And it was just unfortunate timing because about six to eight months later, Vue 3 came out. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was enough of a breaking change for me that it was very frustrating. Uh, yeah. But not just that, there was a component library built into Vue 2 that used Vue 2. It was great. And when Vue 3 came out, that broke too. So not only did I have to up upgrade my framework, I had to upgrade the component library. And oh, whoops, 
Uh, I wanted to be bleeding edge. I couldn't. The new version of that wasn't out yet. They didn't have a Vue 3 version. So I was kind of stuck on this. And I was like, how do we fix this problem? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think framework churn is something that we're going to have to deal with. And I think that's maybe OK. But what if we start taking some of the lower level things like UI components and moving those off to the platform? Like if the component model shifts from Vue, React, Angular, shifts over to the platform and we can start relying on that more, then when frameworks upgrade, which is natural, like frameworks are sort of a test of what can we do? Like, you know, the platform takes time, frameworks are, are cutting edge. What if we had a way to reuse a lot of the fundamental stuff? Like that makes upgrading frameworks a lot easier, right? Why do we have to rebuild buttons every two or three years? Yeah. To me, that yeah. didn't make sense. And that's, that's sort of where the inspiration came from. How do we solve that problem? And that, that tracks so much with what I've always been, you know, internally, it's like people always talk about how web components aren't great for building a whole app in. And that's a thing that web frameworks do really well. The the routing, the, the you know, fast navigation, all of the, the things that you get from both frameworks and meta frameworks, that like the, the glue, the state, those types of things, passing props down, etc., but like the individual components, it makes so much sense to be able to take those from project to project. Not only that, but to not have to worry about, like you said, version updates, which are inevitable and will continue to happen. We talked about how many times we rewrote React code from class components, pure components, function components, hooks, all this stuff and to, to arrive where we're at today. Just imagine if you could have brought along most of your com components. It probably would have saved you a ton of time. So a high level view Let's talk about shoelace and web font or and web awesome and its relationship to each other. So shoelace is awesome. We've been talking about it quite a bit on this show. How how does web awesome relate to shoelace? Are they the same thing? Is it an evolution? Is it a new project? What what is that story? Yeah, so we like to coin web awesome as the like the 3.0 version of shoelace. Part of that is that there's a there's a tiny bit of concern because I, I mean I named this project thinking like it's just going to be me and a couple random people on the internet using it. There, there happens to be a company that's involved in technology that is named Shoelace. So there's a little bit of worry there, but also when we joined Fawn Awesome, it, it kind of made sense to be a little bit more on brand. So so there was a little bit of a double edged thing there. But Web Awesome is a continuation of the project. We, we're cool. doing the next major version. Longevity is something we care a lot about. Uh, we don't like to break things, but for this one release, we're going to be breaking some tag names, SL to WA for our prefix for our HTML tags. But, th but that's really what it is. It's no different. It's the same project. It's the same people behind it. Actually, we have more people behind it. We have brilliant designers. We have the full resources of a very talented company that cares a lot about design and a lot about development, which is something that, you know, Web Awesome is, is taking Shoelace from a component library to a design system that you can pick up and customize by turning a few knobs and cool. just start using, just start building right away. Just pop it right wow. in. So like Scott and I, after this, are recording a project on just getting up and running and doing a demo as quick as you possibly can, right? Because Scott and I, all, to, all day long, we're testing new APIs and like, to the to the point where like we want a nice dev experience, but we also want to get up and running as fast as we possibly can. And like part of me misses that like the days of Angular, you put a script in and you 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 put some tags in the page and it it picks it right on up. Fawn Awesome was the same way. So is, is the idea with the web components is that you can just pop it into? Of course, you can import them and and npm install them and whatnot. But is that the idea? Is that like if I want a good date picker? for a quick demo that I'm doing, I could just pop this thing in and, and I'm up and running. I want to let Connor answer that, but before yeah. before I do, I want to say that we're still working on that date picker. That is that is the uh, like the holy grail of web components. Oh, it yes. is, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, it is a little bit tricky, but we are we are working on that, and I think we're we're committed to getting that in there soon. <laughs> okay, Man, that, awesome. is a, that is a, I a tough. Shouldn't have used that as the example because there's what? How many other components that you have? Yeah, I, I think 40? we're over. I think we're technically just about 50 ish right now. <laughs> yeah. I've lost count. It's it's <laughs> there's a lot. A particular favorite of mine is the drawer, the drawer component. I love that one. Yeah, it's a good or one. Like a drop down. Like, do you, do you have like a filter drop down? That, that's a one that is commonly used. Is that coming? I, I think we will soon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a combo box at that point. OK, but yeah, the filtering and all of that fun stuff, date pickers, they're really hard to get right accessibility wise. Oh, yeah. They're not easy. 
And like, that's our goal is to make these as accessible as possible while still being easy to use. But the other thing is like getting started. We understand that, right? People want to like get started quickly. People want to move. Like that's why the default installation method is a script tag to JS deliver and then a link tag with our CSS custom properties. And then you're off and running. That's like the goal of the project, get you up and running. Then if you want to like, you know, come back and get like only the components you want, because right now with the auto loader, it will like the auto loader is going to be the default in 3.0 spoiler alert by the way like right now the default will load every component um with the auto loader it loads components as it detects the tags but like the the goal is you're still going to incur some cost of importing every component but it's not going to register everyone right away but the goal is really how quickly can you get this set up and then afterwards you can optimize right only import the components you want import pieces here there but like at the end of the day, we want people to get a prototype up quickly and then they can move from there, optimize from their benchmark, whatever the case may be. Yeah. Can you do, go just a little bit like more high level for people who may have never used Shoelace before what the auto loader is? Yeah. So the, the auto loader is basically like if you have a mutation observer on the page that just listens for any time a new element is added or whenever the page is loaded, it will run a query selector for all possible shoelace components. And then if it detects a shoelace component, it will register it with the custom elements dot define API. That's in its simplest form. It's really just a, you know, beefed up mutation observer. Nice. Awesome. So you just drop in a script and it hashtag just works. That's, nice. that's, that's the goal, goal right? <laughs> in theory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm I curious about where Web Awesome fits in the like the categories that we talked about on that last episode. You know, like you on, on one side of it, you have like the React ARIA functions, which is simply just a set of hooks, bring your own divs. Um, and then all the on the other side, it's like full components that look awesome and and they're they're up and running. Where does where, where does this fit? I could take that one. So uh, Shoelace, uh, Web Awesome, sorry. Uh, name <laughs> changes are hard, right? <laughs> and the goal is to be a full design system similar to like the, I would say React Spectrum is the implementation of React yeah. Aria. Oh, okay, um, cool. The goal yeah. is to be the whole design system implementation. Um, we don't really offer too many like low level hooks to like build your own. Some people do. There's a few design systems that have straight up forked shoelace and you know are using the internals of our stuff but like as a whole the goal is when you use shoelace you have a full design system at your disposal and with web awesome now we're going to be getting theming and other things coming along to make the process of customizing a site a lot easier so you don't end up with bootstrap syndrome where everything yeah. looks the same that's good because that's always the the frustration is that You put all this work, especially like if you're putting all this work into accessibility, that was the one thing is like, there's not a React Aria for everything else, you know, like there are components here and there, but there's not an implementation that is that good in other frameworks. So if Web Awesome can be that and give us these primitives, but still give us the flexibility of like being able to style it. And maybe that's my next question is like, what does the styling game look like? Because like one of the frustrations that people have with web components is that web components is a separate DOM. And if you want to be able to reach in there and A, modify the output at HTML or B, be able to add classes and, and style it a little bit differently, it can be a little bit limiting. So what does that look like? This goes back to that bleeding edge concept. Um, When we say web components, I always thought that it was a bad name because everyone thought, oh, it's a web component. It must be like a React Mm. or Vue component. It's not really the case. I like custom elements better because it is just a custom HTML element. The thing about the shadow DOM is, yeah, there's a little black box in there. And it's, 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 it's a blessing and a curse because as authors of custom elements, we can expose certain things. We can do parts, we can do custom properties, and we can we call that our public API. You want to yeah. style these things, use that. Um, and I think people have gotten so accustomed to just taking a component and, and they can manipulate the HTML however they want, and they like that freedom. Uh, and, and it feels good sometimes, but the problem with that freedom is you can also break things and you can also mess up accessibility really easy. So the black box where it becomes a blessing is we handle all that hard stuff for you. If you stick to the public APIs, it's a little different from what you're used to, but it's still fully capable of doing 
all the customizations that you're looking for, you just have to do it a little bit differently, like the CSS part selector that most people seem to not really be aware of yet. Um, and over time, as, as these become more and more ubiquitous, that's going to become a lot more common. Like that's just going to be something that you learn in CSS. Oh, it's a part selector. Which parts are available? Oh, here's the docs. That's how I style that. It's just, it's, there's been a lot of friction there. And so one of the things that we're doing, because Shoelace was traditionally very like, okay, use the parts, target the parts, style those things however you want. And now we're moving to something because there's been so much friction that we're exposing more custom properties. That's something that people are a lot more comfortable with these days. Mm -hmm. You know, they know how those work. They feel good about it. They didn't maybe five, six years ago, but they do now. And I think in mm -hmm. another five to six years, parts are going to be just like that. And so you can have your cake and eat it too. We're going to make it easier because that, that has been a little bit of a pain point, but it, it doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means it's different from how you're, how you're used to doing it. Can you can you tell us really quickly for people who have never used part like explain like I'm five what exactly that is in CSS? Yeah, so so it's 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 quite fascinating. Um, when I when I say shadow DOM, you know, a, a custom element is what we like to call a host element, right? And everything inside of that host element, if it uses shadow DOM, that's that little black box, and we can control the structure as authors of that. And we can expose certain things and hide certain things from our consumers. And so the things that we expose, that's called our public API. That, that's the stuff that we're not going to break, right, from version, from whatever version. We're not going to break that. You can rely on that, just like, a, right, just like semantic versioning, right? A major version, we may change it, but minors and patch versions, it, you can rely on that. And so parts are where we have a certain structure inside a custom element that we say, hey, this particular div or this particular header, or this particular thing inside here, this element is called, you know, part equals whatever. Uh, and it's just an attribute. We give it a name. And in CSS, you can use a, you know, colon, colon, part, parentheses, but, but then you target it that way. And then you just use regular CSS properties, right? So with a custom property, you can expose those, those, those go right through Shadow DOM. They're, they're designed to just kind of penetrate that. But with parts, we actually give you a specific element inside of that black box and say, style it however you want to. Mm -hmm. Whatever properties you want to apply, have at it. Nice. Awesome. And I, I think one more thing we should probably say to the audience as well, especially if they didn't listen to the episode with Brad Frost on design system. The reason why we are so stoked about web components is that we don't, need a React version of... Uh, we do, actually. React is one of the few frameworks where React's you do need uh, yeah. an a one for every single one. And Shoelace does make it work with, with React. But the idea that if you have a large company, I have a friend who works at a local bank. They have a 1,000 developers. They got three Angular apps, six React apps, three Vue apps. And they have a design system that needs to work across the board. And either you're doing a whole bunch of work re-implementing that in every single one, and you got to make sure the accessibility is bang on, and the it looks exactly the same, and the same thing happens when you hit escape twice in all the components. That's a ton of work. Or you can just do that once in web components, and you can very easily use web components in these different frameworks or, or write adapters that will sort of handle them. And that's that's huge for, uh, amongst the other benefits we talked about, that's huge for companies that want to be able to port things from framework to framework or design system to uh, different projects that they're working on. Yeah. And a big reason why I like DOM first frameworks, right? Frameworks that use the DOM. There's a reason why yeah, that that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Wes, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned design systems and how all this fits in because custom elements are, are like a natural progression of where people want to be. I actually got into this whole thing, and and the reason that Shoelace 2.0 with Web Components came about was because I was working at a company where we had a problem. We had Angular, we had a little bit of React, we had some folks that were just rogue doing vanilla everything, and they had three to four implementations of different components, and one design team that said, hey, like you know, your button should look like this, all your panels should look like that. And so, and so that's actually what my first uh, journey into web components was, how do we solve this problem? How do we make all these things consistent? And that's where it all kind of started. And um, you know, back then it was very early. Uh, we were using polyfills left and right. IE 11 oh, was still yeah. a concern. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's where it all kind of kicked off. And, and, it, and it clicked to me like, but why, why do this at every single company? Maybe we could do this at a much <laughs> higher level in an open source way and let people just kind of take these components and run with them, just like their HTML elements. 
Yeah, we all love and use HTML elements. They're super handy for us. Uh, what if we had more of them? And they, they were great. So uh, <laughs> yeah. that's that's really web components, right? And that's that's I think where it fits in super well here. So um, yeah, this is a, kind of a dream project for me. I'm I'm stoked to see you guys pick this up. One one question I have while we're talking about like HTML elements as well is like what are your thoughts on the sort of the new stuff that's happening with the Open UI? Uh, initiative. So anyone listening, Open UI is a working group that's got together and they've been researching and writing proposals for new inputs. Like there's a reason why nobody uses input type of date in the browser because it sucks, you know, like it doesn't look good. You have no control over it. So a lot of the new ones pop over API. We already saw there was a, an initial implementation of combo box and select box. It's being revised right now due to some feedback from, from WebKit. So like these APIs are so much more flexible where like they allow you to use multiple parts together and you can build your own custom filterable multi-select combo box. And it's just, it's awesome seeing that type of thing. And like, obviously the, those are two. <laughs> you guys have what, 50 <laughs> and are still working on on new ones. We're a long ways from from that type of thing. But will you use these browser APIs or maybe the polyfills when it comes time to using these types of things? Yeah, so this, this is actually the thing I'm most excited for about Web Awesome, the 3.0 version, is we get to move a lot of this stuff that we were doing with bespoke implementations. We have this focus trap API that I have had many headaches and nightmares about oh, yeah. for our dialogue. <laughs> and it I'm is... Familiar. It's a monster, right? And like we get to move over to a dialogue element now that just handles it for us. And whatever they do, we can be like, this is what the browser does, right? It lets yeah. us offload a lot of complexity and a lot of issues with cross browser support and everything. The new popover API means we get to remove, hopefully, once it becomes more stable and we get anchored regions in CSS mm -hmm. too. That's the other thing too, is we get all the benefits of CSS and HTML. Yeah. So, like, we. The new anchored region stuff coming out means we get to get rid of floating UI, which awesome library, by the way. Floating UI, if you're building any drop downs, combo boxes, whatever, the, anything that is not absolutely positioned somewhere, floating UI is oh, wow. absolutely the best. Never but seen this. we get to get rid of that and let the browser do it for us. So, like, I'm actually most excited about the things we're removing in Web Awesome because we get to use browser APIs that, you know, maybe we didn't get around to in 2.0 because it'd result in breaking changes and other things. So that's what really excites me is as these advances come along, we just get to plug them in and we get the benefits from it. Yeah, imagine that you can spend your time on things that are more interesting, more fun components than having to worry about implementation <laughs> details and an API that sucks in the browser. Yeah. That's uh, awesome. I, here, I have a question that I posed last uh, episode about this as well, and I'm curious what your thoughts are. So you have a you have a popover, like a dialog box that pops up, and in that you have a form uh, element. Oh, yeah. And as you are <laughs> typing in an input, you hit the escape key. What happens? Does it clear the suggestion or should it close the uh, entire modal box? What are your thoughts? I, I, I can tell you right now what we do. We, we, do, we clear the suggestion because we check the path of the events when it's a, an escape key like that. And we check if you're inside of like a, ah, if you're yes. inside of a input button text area. I think there's a couple of content. I wrote editable. that exact code. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, and we use composed path too. So it also checks like if it's in a shadow Dom somewhere too. Nice. So it, it just does a quick find to make sure you're not on any of these like tags that you shouldn't be that has its own escape key functionality. So that's so to me, you don't close the dialogue if you're inside of a interactive field. Little did you know that was going to be an answer or a question with a right and wrong answer, and you got it. You got it correct. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, well, we actually take it a step further, and, and this the cool thing about it is the platform is always evolving, and so normally you have to do all these checks and and mm -hmm. we're very early but there is an API for handling exactly that calls called close watcher API 
And we, this has already been implemented. And it's, it's, I don't think it's in any of the evergreen like live browsers, but I think it might be in some of the canaries at this point. Um, but we're ready for that. Like, so we're looking for these new things. Like, can we get rid of all this extra code to do all these checks and just use the browser's APIs? And that's, that's a huge part of what we believe in is like, can we get rid of more code and just focus more on like what we said earlier, just the components, just the styles? How do we make this your design system and get rid of the cruft and just give you all the good stuff and let you focus on that? Wow. Close Watcher is proof that like Wes and I spend all day, every day looking at this stuff. And I've never heard of this yes. API. <laughs> it, it, well, we're, like I said, bleeding edge. <laughs> this was a PR. I don't know if you guys know Luke Warlow. He does a lot of platform work for Agalia. It's mm-hmm. like a, they do like open source. They're they're like big yep. proponents behind like the open UI stuff. Uh, he's the one who did the PR for Close Watcher for us. And that's how I found out about it. So he's the yeah, one who actually to Luke. showed us. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Luke is like my go-to for like all these strange, bizarre browser behavior stuff. I just, I'm just like, Luke, is this supposed to happen? <laughs> yeah, he's a high quality Twitter follow. Luke underscore yeah. Warlow, W-A-R-L-O-W. Big fan. That's awesome. Because like on, I think yesterday, I found a bug in the Syntax website. We have a share dialogue and we use, is it dialogue or popover that we use, Scott? Uh, we use both. Okay. Um, we have had <laughs> for like that a in particular. I yeah, think it's dialogue. I think it was dialogue. Yes. So we we opened it and we have a a boolean of if it's open or not. And if you click the X, it sets a boolean and and hides it. But then if you hit the escape key, it actually closes the dialogue box. So I was finding out that if you hit the X, it hit it visually, but didn't actually close it. Uh, so I had to write a little oh, bit of code that I just moved it bad. over to the. Um, the on close event, and I was like, ah, oh, b- browser standards, you know, like we t- yeah. you take code out of the code base. There's no, you don't need the boolean of if it's open or not. You simply just use the browser methods to open, close, check if it's open, all that good stuff. Let's talk about Kickstarter really quick because um, it, it's funny. Kickstarter is one of those platforms that I think a lot of people, I don't know, it felt like it was popular. I don't know when, maybe about the time that like, what was that Groupon was popular, right? It, it's like of that era, <laughs> but it still gets a massive amount of traffic and it's still like a very widely used website, but maybe people don't think about it as much as they used to. I, I, I'm interested in, well, one, the Kickstarter has been extremely successful. And by the time this comes out, it will come out on April 19th. So your It'll Kickstarter will still be then. going. Well, it'll still be going. If you're listening to this and you want to support, we'll have links to that and you'll still have time to hop in. I, I'm a, I hopped in on one of the early bird tiers a couple, a week ago or so. I want to know a little bit about the decision to launch on Kickstarter and how that's been. You know, that decision goes back to the Fawn Awesome 5 Kickstarter, I think, where, you know, it, it, that's, that's the Kickstarter like record for software. That's the most earned. There's, there's two records, um, and I'm, I'm not as good at, off the top of my head here, but it's the most amount funded, I think, and maybe maybe it's the most number of backers or something like that. Yeah, that's uh, so what there's some the, records. Yeah, that's what yeah, I Yeah, so there's some records to be had there, and, and that's that's just phenomenal. Like, I think, you know, that that kicks, that Fun Awesome 5 video was just awesome. Um, and so we... We actually, we just kind of wanted to relive that, I guess. Um, and I'm really glad to be a part of it because we actually got to go out to Los Angeles back in August, film this whole new video that, you know, that's on there. And and it's it's just a heck of a time, right? But the cool thing about that is you're, you're telling a story. You know, we're, 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 yes, it's a pre-sale, we're selling a product, but we're telling a story about how we turn, how we turn this free thing into something that's still free and even better, but also we add a lot more to it. Um, and how you could be part of that. So it, it's really, I think it's one of the best platforms, maybe not for software, but it works for Fawn Awesome apparently. <laughs> but for most software, I, I don't think it works as, as well for, for whatever reason. Um, yeah, I, I don't know why exactly. But it's it's just something that we we, we seem to connect with and vibe with. And uh, our, our followers seem to kind of appreciate that. And, you know, we can add swag, we get all sorts of things to it. So it just kind of works for some reason for us. Yeah. Do you think that the success of the Font Awesome Kickstarter directly impacted the success of the Web Awesome one? I, I absolutely think it helps. Yeah, oh, yeah. right. Because people are familiar. Um, another piece of that that helps is is Font Awesome was this open source thing, right? And then they they how do we how do we keep the lights on? That's always a mm-hmm. common story in open source. And that was how 
that was, that was what made it all possible. You know, now there's a company, now we have, you know, employees, we have all these things that, that we could do with it, um, and keep making it better. And, it, you know, open source is, it has been a struggle. I've launched a number of open source things that fizzled out. And it's like, you give away a lot of free time, a lot of effort. And when you, when you try to put a price tag on, you're immediately like a sellout. And we didn't want to mm -hmm. send that message. I very particularly didn't want to send the message of like, Hey, I just, I want your money now. Like I'm flipping mm -hmm. switches off. Give me money. That's crappy. I want to give stuff away, but I also want to eat. I want to feed my family. I think we all kind of share that in open source. Uh, and this, this was a path that has been proven and, my decision to join Fawn Awesome when, when you know, we started talking about this and how, how things would work, they, they have a good track record of open source, right? Like they've added tons and I think it's been like thousands of icons to the, to the free version of Fawn Awesome. And we plan on doing something similar with uh, Web Awesome where, or, you know, Shoelace is now Web Awesome, where we're going to be adding a lot more of the free stuff. But to keep us being able to do that, we need to start offering other things that are above and beyond that. So it's, it's you know, it's a replay of that. I don't know how else we would do it. I think it's clearly it's working. So that's the good news. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Man, do you, do you have any idea of what the like, I don't know if it's called the premium inputs are going to be or, or premium components are going to be. But like there's been many times where I'm happy to shell some money out to stop the pain of certain areas of dev. Yeah. One thing we don't want to do is lock away like the best stuff. Because like, you know, if, if we lock away the best stuff, nobody's going to use it. We're just giving away garbage. We want to mm -hmm. give away some of the best stuff, but then some of the really complex stuff, like I'm going to, I'm going to toss it over to Connor here to talk about that stuff. But like some of the more complex components, those are the things that we're putting in pro. Some of the stuff where there are companies dedicated to selling like these specific components. These are things oh, that yeah. we're adding to pro. So we're not trying to just put a price tag on everything. We're trying to put a price tag on the things that you'd probably be paying for anyways. Yeah. Connor, you should, you should talk about the rich text editor stuff. <laughs> yep. I knew that was coming. Yep. The rich text <laughs> editor. That's a big one. That no one, one wants to build rough. a rich text editor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if, and if you look, Look at rich text editors out there. They have awful licenses. They are exorbitantly expensive. It's like mm -hmm. you're either an enterprise and paying for this or you're just not getting a rich text editor. And the licenses are like you can't even modify source. It's not even like copy left. It's just like what you what we give you is what you get. This is all you get. Nothing more. And pay us a lot of money every year. <laughs> so I actually have built a reg text editor for Rails using TipTap, which is built on top mm. of Pros Mirror, which is like pretty much like probably the best text editor library out there. It's great. There's yeah. also some new ones. I can't. It's from Facebook. I think it's Lexical is a new one. It's a lot smaller than Pros Mirror. It's probably about a third of the size. So like there's a lot of libraries out there, but it's really hard to get it all together well. And the UI is really where oh, rich yeah. text editors are so hard. There's so many icons. And like how many of you have used a rich text editor with just an awful table editor inside of it? It's Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah or the pay, just the paste alone, you know? And I, <laughs> yeah. I don't. Yep. I've I've seen code that like a paste does like tiny MCE something like that. I do mm -hmm. not envy anyone working on that. That's hard stuff. Yeah, it's rough too because browsers actually all handle paste slightly differently. Like <laughs> depending on the age of the browser, you only get certain things with paste. And then on top of it, like Safari is a lot more security focused when you paste. So you only you don't always get all the information. So you have to have a bunch of like try catches and like backfills and like, you know, you just progressively work your way down from what you get from the browser, which may not always be the same in Chrome versus Safari versus Firefox. So it's it's really tough to get right. And there's a reason why th th there's not tons of these out there. Yeah. Yeah. Man, even like, I know people that make a living on like file, image file upload, you know, upload the file, resize it, whatever, <laughs> mark it up and then send it along its way. There's just so many little, I was just looking at Widgmo was, is the, was the big one back in the day. I'm just looking up how much it is. $800 per developer <sighs> per year. It's a big business. And like data grids are huge where yep, data grids some are huge. stock trading company needs to be able to filter a list of stocks and have it update every six milliseconds. And it's a, a wild world that these businesses are out there. And I'm glad to see it because it obviously like <laughs> Fawn Awesome can sell like icons. They sold a million dollars of the icons on Kickstarter alone. And they're able to like 
hire you guys to to work on this type of stuff like that's beautiful <laughs> i mean the thing is when you look at it like Corey said some of these components that we have planned for pro like they're pro because these are legitimately full business components right like <laughs> data visualization right like who here's paid for what's it uh high charts is the big one right yeah high charts and everything <laughs> exactly right like you know that's a hundred thousand dollars a year depending on your size right like the then there's also so that you have data viz and then you have rich text editors data grids another one ag grid who's used ag grid right like things massive <laughs> exactly right <laughs> yeah. like these the fact that these are all in one component set and they're all using the same styles some same consistency that's like the big sell of like we can't legitimately give away some of these for free because there's so much time effort and everything spent into these. And we're happy to give you primitives, right? Like, you know, the selects and the, even date picker is a little iffy, but like the thing is these more complex ones, data grid, data visualization, rich text editors, like that's just really hard to give away for free because of the fact that these are full businesses alone. Yeah, it, it's funny. I was looking at your um, your goals, the stretch goals. So you, you guys uh, destroyed your goals, and now you're on the stretch goals. And I was seeing that the five hundred thousand dollars stretch goal was the charting package in Web Awesome. And I wanted to say, are you sure that you want to do that? Because like, I knew that was coming. Packages are so hard; <laughs> yeah. they're no fun. <laughs> yeah, you're you're yeah. not wrong. We've we've had some internal discussion about that. Um, and I, I, I don't know if, if, it, if it was that we're just crazy or if we think that we're maybe we didn't think we were going to get this far. Uh, and I think it's inevitable. We're, we're, we're looking like we're, we're going to be building some charts soon. Nice. Um, yeah. I'd, and, and, and that's 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 the thing, though, like like Connor said, like we're building the more complex things. And those are the things we're charging for. But there's another curious thing about Fawn Awesome that I always personally thought like they are a little bit underpriced for what they offer. Um, and so if I'm going to take an open source project and join a company and, and sell out, as a lot of people would say, I, I want to make sure that they have, you know, we're doing this in good faith and that we're not going to be charging people ridiculous prices. We don't want to box people out. Like if you're paying for something, you know, m make it very reasonable, almost stupidly reasonable to where you can't not pay for it. Like you can't justify trying to build any of this stuff yourself. Yeah. But when, when it comes to charts, yeah, we're, we're going to be busy. Um, yeah, we are. Uh, <laughs> and that's a, you know, I mean, the amount of, to be clear, the amount of things that you're getting for free here are, are outrageous. And the the goals when you're contributing on Kickstarter, do you want to go over maybe a little bit about like what you're giving away if you do contribute to this project and, and why might somebody want to donate to this? Yeah, I, I see it more as a, as a pre-sale. And I, I don't yeah. want to sound very markety here. That, that's not the intent, even though that's what we're talking about. But one thing that Fawn Awesome did and that we're, we're continuing that pattern here is if you if you're an early backer and you do this, you you get that price for life, right? We're not gonna we're not gonna be like oh first year and then you pay full price. So so we really appreciate the people that are out there that that believe in us that say hey we're gonna put our money here and, and trust in you to to bring us all this awesome stuff, right? Because we have a lot built, uh, but we don't have it all built yet. That's you know we're still doing some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of trust there, and so that's our way of saying thanks, like. If you get it now, we're gonna we're gonna honor that for the life of your subscription. So the rewards are are pretty much that. You know, you're 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 an early backer. You're gonna get a price that no one else is is ever gonna get. Bragging rights, I guess, is a good one there. <laughs> That's great. Have Have you guys ever dipped into to drag and drop? Um, I've been following Alex Reardon. He, I think he wrote React drag and drop, and and then he just released Pragmatic drag and drop, and it's just. I watched a whole talk of them. I was like, this guy probably knows the most about drag and drop in the entire world. <laughs> I don't I don't know that we have anything planned for it, but I've been following for a while. I, it was React Beautiful d and I think it, it's called. Okay. React mm -hmm. Beautiful That's Drag yeah. and Drop. And it's all under at Atlassian, Atlas Kit. I forget what, what the Atlas package kit. scope yeah, is. Yeah. Kit, and it's called Pragmatic Drag and Drop now. Yeah. And, and so the original, obviously, React Beautiful d and was under... It was only React, right? And this pragmatic one is the like latest. This is like brand new. This is like a week ago he brand released new. it. Yeah. yeah, I don't know when this is going to air, but like this is like fresh off the press. And I've seen some of the demos of it, like dragging across iframes and stuff. And you have to like change the opacity while you're dragging to be able to drag across iframes <laughs> or drag from one browser to another. And then you get like a um, a data transfer event. Like it's 
there's a lot there and you know i think if we ever do anything with drag and drop we're probably just going to pull that package in and wrap it in some yeah. nice way because it totally. is challenging i'm curious how how that do you know how that works because it works with react felt view angular and so on so is that is it web components or is it just a bunch of dom code that has to be surfaced I haven't looked into it. I'm assuming it is DOM code that has to be surfaced because yeah. I haven't seen anything that points to anything else. My best guess is they probably do something with like the draggable attribute or something and then have like a mutation observer with like an attribute filter for it. That'd be my best guess. I don't know 100%. I haven't I haven't even had time to look into it yet. And like, yeah. This package cool. has excited me for so long, but like it's so new, I haven't even looked in. And there's, it's a big package because it it has wrappers for like you said, it's felt view react. So it's like there's, it's a big code base, but like the core of it is pretty tiny as well. Cool. We can talk about the layout component at the one million dollar mark. That's been <laughs> you know my my living misery for the last year of my life. Yeah, what's the layout component? Yeah, so the layout component is like a culmination of me staring at tons of websites and seeing what like the general layout of most of these websites are. <laughs> and I originally built one at Microsoft on their original design system, but it was very like stripped down. It was, this is the way we're going to do it. There's no other permutations of this. This is it. And even that took me like a solid four months of like, how do I get this right? How do I make this extensible? How do I make this in a way that like, if somebody needs to break out, they can break out. And then I got hired into Web Awesome after I had been, they pulled me off of the design system working with web components to do a bunch of AI stuff. Because this is like, you know, um, sometime had to have been around June or so. I think June is when I actually joined. So it would have been before then. So like at the start of the new year, they're like, oh yeah, you're going to work entirely with AI now and do Langchain. So I came <laughs> over to Web, Web Awesome. Yeah, it was not my cup of tea. I, I just didn't enjoy the work, right? Like I enjoyed building with web components. So I, I came over to Web Awesome and I'm like, all right, cool. And then they're like, all right, we have this layout component to build. And I was like, well, I've done that before, but now it's a lot more challenging where anyone can put whatever layout they want, right? Like I'm no longer restricted to this is the Microsoft way of layout. So it was really challenging. And even the docs on it are challenging because it's abstract enough to where, you know, we, we have a bunch of at, at its core. It's simply a couple resize observers and some slots that let you slot into certain places. And, you know, it's pretty stripped down in that sense you have sticky sidebars if you do like the holy grail layout where you have like the three column center and then a header above footer below like that's like the ideal scenario for it but like there's other things we want to do like you write your navigation once and it can like move into both spots and you don't have to write your navigation like all, you, all your top header links can then move into a drawer or fly in panel that comes in from the left mm. once you get to a certain break point. And so that's really like the challenge of it was supporting all these different ways to build, having the ejection mechanisms for most layouts and like seeing what most sites did. And like there's even challenging things around like you have to calculate the height of the header and then you want like the the two sides of the main content. So like if you have that three column, the two side columns, you want those to be sticky because you don't want those moving with like the main page as you're scrolling down like in a doc site, right? Like it's the worst when you're in a documentation site and you have to scroll down to be able to scroll the sidebar. So you lose like your main content area and like you're trying to find where you want in the yeah. side navigation menu. Like it's it's challenging because then you need to like with the sticky, you need to calculate like how big is our header and make sure that you're like sitting below that. So, you know, like the amount of like hmm. I think it's margin effort or the top is what you said on it. So it was really hard to build. <laughs> yeah. I think the point Connor's trying to make is layouts are really hard. Uh, yeah, and and yeah. a lot of the components that we're building are are just as hard. Uh, and, and I like to think of it like from a design system engineer perspective, it's easy to build a component for a specific use, but it's really hard to build a component that can just work in as many places as possible and maintain the ability to customize, maintain the ability to do exactly what you need with it. Yeah, especially if that's the goal, right? The goal is to be able to use these wherever and all over the place. I had a question that was a little bit fun here that we can have as maybe the last question before we wrap up. 
What are both of your favorite components to both use and work on? Um, and I'm, I'm going to say not counting the rich text editor since we already talked about that one. Go ahead, Connor. Uh, you got to give me a sec. I, I, what? I'm not even sure what my favorite is. What's been the one that you're excited to work yeah. on or build? I'm, I'm excited to work on Combo Box. I've started it um in some free time but like combo box is like a really hard one to get right but everyone uses them everyone loves them yeah so combo box really excites me as for my favorite i feel like my favorite may be i would say probably drawer is my favorite because i feel like i use that all the time for Dang. like small like once you get down to the small viewport sizes it's great to just be able to have all your links come in with it i think that one is fantastic for me it would probably be dialogue um weird because dialogues on the web are kind of eh but th there's a good purpose if you use them right and, and and it's not the version that you see in shoelace today it's the version you're going to see in web awesome which is where we actually move to the actual dialogue element and we get to scrap all that code we talked about earlier because it visually looks the same but every time I click that button I, and I see that dialog, I know that we've we've been able to remove so much garbage code that we don't want to have put in there for focus trapping and everything else, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it just comes natural. So uh, you know, it's it's sort of that appreciative. Um, we we appreciate the platform for what it what it continues to let us remove from our library. Nice, sick, awesome. Uh, let's get into the next section, which is uh, shameless plugs and sick picks. Uh, do you guys come prepared with a sick pick? We did. What do you got for us? Yeah, I'll go first. So I don't know if you guys know about the enhanced.dev um, by Brian LaRue and his team over there. Um, and Begin, I, I don't know. I'm oh, sure yeah. There's a we've, lot more to it. We've had Brian on the show. He's probably one of our... We've had very few guests on more than once. And I think we've had Brian on three times now. Big yeah. Thing. Yeah. So they just released their SSR module to be able to run across any server. So like you, if you have like a uh, yeah. PHP server or you have a Rust server, whatever the case, Ruby, whatever the case may be, they released their SSR module. And I was diving in yesterday. I was so excited. It was just released yesterday. And I was so excited to dive in. And I was like, what are they doing here? And there is a fantastic package underneath that's powering it all called Xtism. And Xtism is like a WASM library that allows you to package up a library that you're using written in like Rust or something, Rust C, whatever the case may be, and then run hmm. it in these other runtimes like a JavaScript, Ruby, et cetera. So Xtism.org, fantastic. It's a super exciting project for oh, WASM. Oh, that's cool. So it, basically, if you have an app that needs JavaScript to run, but you are using a Python server, um, it's a pretty common use case, right? Like a, if somebody in Ruby or someone in Python, someone in PHP world, you still need, sometimes you need JavaScript server tools because that's what most tools are built in. So you can bundle it up for Wasm, but then Xtism will allow you to run it on these different mm. platforms. That's sweet. Yep, exactly. Nailed it. I'm so excited about all this Wasm stuff. Like every time we <laughs> talk about it, I'm just like, giddy so i've been i've been thinking about how to do ssr with web components forever right and like the, yeah the thought i'd always come to was like you need like a static template you need like a universal templating language and i'm like mm. once i see wasm i was like wow this makes so much sense like it, it's just string in string out end of the day add some data and you know some context essentially right and wow. you string in string out right like that's the the easy goal string in string out i like that <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a common theme with with the SSR story and web components that you hear from, especially like the React crowd, where you know they just plug in Next and everything just works for them. You know, somebody's done that hard work already, and with the platform, things take longer. And you know, where are we there yet? Are we there yet with the SSR <laughs> stories? Like that's the last remaining thing that people seem to be like, ah, I don't want to use them because SSR. Well, we're so close to having that solved. And, and I feel like after yesterday's announcement with that package and, and with the work that we're doing on our side to make this happen, like we're, we're going to disprove all of that. I mean, SSR is going to be a non-issue. And there's just at that point, there's really no reason why you wouldn't want to start thinking about custom elements. Nice. Uh, Corey, sick pick. So my sick pick is, is, is going to be lit. And, and the reason is not just because we use it. Uh, there's a reason why I used it. Shoelace didn't start with lid. It started with stencil. And then 
eventually I was like, how can I make this slimmer? Like, you know, I want to, I want to make it as thin and close to the platform as possible. Started rolling my own library. Yeah, that was kind of dumb, but I did. Mm-hmm. And I realized that I was kind of just building lit and, and the size almost matched up to once I added all the features that I wanted. And so, um, I really appreciate the work that they've done over there. Justin Fignani and the team over there at lit that has just made this the like de facto. I mean, there's a lot of great libraries out there not to take away from them, but, uh, for me, lit has been like the de facto, if I'm going to roll, especially a collection of web components, it's going to be with lit because I, I tried and I cannot make a smaller library (laughs) than what that does to create these with, with the tools and in the, uh, abstractions that I prefer to have. So, uh, lit.dev. Nice. Sick. We'll get that uh, linked up. We've had uh, uh, Justin on the show too. Lit, Lit is an awesome project. Uh, and definitely check it out. Yeah. I'd, lo- I'd love to add on to that too. Um, yeah. So yeah. there's also, so it's actually broken up inside of Lit. There's Lit Element, which is like the web component wrapper. And then there's Lit HTML. And Lit HTML is such a fantastic way to write tag template literals. Um, I know front end master uses it. Like you don't need lit for web components because you have lit HTML. If you want to just write some JS HTML, you know, it's such a fantastic library. So much of it is, it just feels like you're writing HTML. It doesn't feel like, you know, you're writing some bespoke dialect. Yeah. And I, I, to add on to that, um, if you're writing HTML on the server and you're not using like a JavaScript framework or whatever, building out templates, building out anything with HTML, and it's super simple, like you said, to use that template tag literal. You get access to all JavaScript. You can do your loops and all that stuff inside of there. So it, it's really, it's really pretty sick. And maybe now we're gonna get signals. Actually, that's one question I didn't even ask you. Is like, what are you? I don't care. It's my podcast. We can we can ask it. What are you doing for like internal state? Right? You gotta like you gotta. Sometimes you have to hold data intern inside of these components. I assume. What do you use for that? I can answer this. So, um, yeah. so we just use Lit's base wrapper. So Lit has this idea of properties, right? So these properties, um, at the end of the day, they're really like wrappers with getters and setters. Yeah. So like if Lit ends up using signals under the hood, then we get that benefit for free. But Lit kind of has its own like state management in a way. Uh, and it has it keeps tracks of what properties change as well. So you have like this will update hook and to see like what properties are changing so you can update certain things. So we largely just use what Lit gives us. Sweet. Nice. Yeah, that's for low level stuff, right? As as things start to grow and, and I don't think custom elements are there, like web components are there as a community where you have like a web component based framework, right? You start talking about state management. You're talking about actually building apps right now. Yeah, we're building lower level, lower level stuff where that's not quite as relevant. But I do see as people start to realize this is a really good component model. It's interoperable. It works everywhere. How can we make that better? I what I, my theory is frameworks are going to pick up on that. In, in enough years, we're going to start seeing a pivot to where they're like, yeah, you know, it might be the Svelte, it might be the Preact, it might be the whatever version of custom elements that you're building. But at the end of the day, they're custom elements. Now mm-hmm. the frameworks start to focus less on component models and more on things like routing and state management and stuff, the things that were really going to shine. So I think that's mm-hmm. where we're going to go with it. But um, I do want to say, I think Lit has an experimental, the Lit Labs, I, I do believe they have an experimental signals package. Wow. Um, largely influenced by Preact already that's out there. Um, yeah, pretty the sure I've Preact seen that. One. Preact one yeah. is influential for sure. Um, we'll have a link to the Kickstarter. So you'll still have some time if you're listening to this to support the Kickstarter. I highly recommend you do. Is there anything else you would like to plug while you're here? I mean, that that's that's that was my plug. So if I get another yeah. one, uh, I'd have to think about it. <laughs> oh, no, that's good. Sorry, yeah, I took it for you, you my plug dad. as much no, as you want. I think our record, yeah. Darcy picked like nine things. So, <laughs> oh, amazing! <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, what I would say is, if you're listening to this today, and and if this comes out before the Kickstarter ends, that's that's awesome. Go to webawesome.com. It's going to bring you straight to the Kickstarter. You can get those lifetime subscription prices that are they're they're never going to be as you know with inflation with everything else they're never going to be lower than this price. But if you're listening to this later on and you end up going to webawesome.com. And if we've not released yet, if we've not launched the final product yet, we're still going to have an early-ish backer price. So it might, might not be the same price, but I've, I've been told that we're going to have still some sort of discount for those folks. And once we launch, that's, you know, the price is going to be the price. So um, that's my plug. You know, I, I'm, I've devoted years of my life to building these low-level components. And uh, 
I do want to say, um, not necessarily plugging a product, but plugging all the folks that are out there backing us that have been cheering us on this whole time. We appreciate that. It's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Wicked. You're welcome. Awesome. I will well, give thank, myself a pat on so the much back for... because. <laughs> I Sorry, go ahead, Scott. <laughs> no, I'm just gonna, I was just kind of congratulating myself for backing them and also talking about a shoelace on the show. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I forgot to tell the one hilarious story of uh, Connor on Twitter was replied to the show that we did uh, and about shoelace. And I was like, yeah, shoelace is a good fit because it's built on web components. <laughs> And he very nicely told me, I know, I work on shoelace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's my full-time job. <laughs> uh, that's kind of what I do. Uh, uh, and it's it. not the first time I did that. I it was explaining to the product manager of Shopify Hydrogen what Shopify Hydrogen was. And he's like, uh, I know. I always click that profile. Yeah, I always click I that profile and be that. like, who is this person? <laughs> yeah, what is <laughs> Yeah. What am I getting uh, into? Yeah. All right. Yeah. I feel that. Uh, cool. Well, thank you guys good. so much for coming on. I can't wait to, one, see what Web Awesome becomes, but also use it in all my stuff because, uh, yeah, it, it's fantastic. So thank you so much for your time. And uh, I you know, hope it continues to raise money here. Could I, yeah. could I plug one last thing as well? I didn't get to, to plug here. Connor, oh, yeah. plug away. Yeah. So um, obviously Web Awesome, want to plug that, that. Go check it out. But the other thing is everyone doing all the UI work. We talked about it, open UI, go check them out. They're doing awesome work. Egalia, they do a lot of open source work. Um, some of the people from there, Brian Cardell, he has like a library for working with Shadow Dom, exposing it. A mm -hmm. Luke Warlow, like everyone who has answered all the bugs that I've filed on Chromium, WebKit, whatever, like everyone doing work for the browsers. Like uh, I just want to plug them because they're awesome and they help us a lot to be able to make better things. Sick. All right, that's it. All right. Thank Thanks, you. Scott. Thanks, Wes. Thanks, really everybody. appreciate the Thank opportunity. Thank you guys for having us. Later.